Thank you very much. I want to thank Neem and the department and the guys who invited me here. It's great to be here. So um, I'm going to talk about, I mean, I have separated in two parts my, my talk. One, one part is the presentation of the political economy stupid exhibition. And the reason I'm doing this is exactly the second part, actually. Uh, because it was the first exhibition we presented under the massive cut we had at the museum where I work. So uh, let me just start talking about this. So State Museum of Contemporary Art is the museum that owns the, one of the most important collections in Greece, the Kostakis collection. Uh, it's a Russian avant-garde collection mainly. Uh, it travels all around the world in, in many museums and uh, it is actually what keeps it alive uh, until now, in a way. The Contemporary Art Center is an autonomous part of the museum, and uh, this is where I'm actually working as uh, a, a curator. And, uh, I'm not going to come down today. Uh, so, uh, the political economy is stupid uh, was uh, uh, a great chance we had to both talk about the crisis in a way and what happened in Greece and also have some uh, uh, real artistic uh, you know, involvement in, uh, in the center uh, in political involvement presenting art in the contemporary art center. Um, the idea was mainly uh, the, the directors, Siago Tiara's idea, because um, let's start talking about the practical issues. It was a, a, an exhibition that would have a very big cost. We wouldn't have to transport artworks. It was just all video. Uh, some of them were sent by Oliver uh, through the internet and some of them were just uh, coming uh, with uh, the artists. Here you can see part of the view of the exhibition as well as uh, an event that happened at the opening. And the presentation of the central space. It's a quite big space, so we have four very big screens at the center and then uh, wall uh, paintings and videos all around the space. And here's the first floor idea. You're gonna see all these works anyway tonight. So it was really interesting for us because we had no money at all. Um, it is very difficult to work in an institution, semi-private actually and semi-public, um, mainly uh, funded by the Ministry of Culture and uh, Sports today. So it was the almost no budget exhibition we had to have for the first time. Most of the exhibition we used to have were about like a budget of 10,000 at least. Uh, 25,000, 10,000 was the least. And this one was 3,000 uh, from the museum and 1,000 euros from the uh, Austrian embassy, thankfully. Um, we had many problems. We had to see how we, got, we had to solve. One of them was that we could not uh, accommodate all the artists, so we didn't. Uh, we had to explain the situation to both Gregory and Oliver, and thankfully they were really uh, had understanding. Uh, and of course we had many videos in English, that means we had to subtitle them in Greek so people could understand the, uh, what, what exactly works were about. Uh, what we had to do was to find um, a way of having subtitling in a free uh, way. This is a very expensive, actually, uh, work. But uh, we had an idea of inviting um, a school of subtitling and uh, asking them to put this in program of their uh, practice, their internship. So thankfully that worked. We were lucky this time. And uh, on the other hand, of course, we had the help of the Get Institute who managed to accommodate. They have a beautiful house, so they accommodated one, a couple of artists, if I'm not wrong for art in Thessaloniki. Now, um, this exhibition was just the beginning of surviving without money, though we were an institution, a, a national institution, a state institution. We had to, to be for the first time uh, working like an NGO, actually. 
but uh, still be a state institution. I had to have, I was getting, I'm actually getting my salary, but work with artists who are not paid. So, so that, that is an issue. You have to think about what exactly you're doing, what are the ethics of your job, what is exactly your profession, and how accurately you're doing it. Uh, I'm going to make a little parenthesis here. I wanted to do it about political art as well, because uh, it's interesting to see how political involved art is uh, actually running even now in Greece and how these artists involved with the political issues are actually living and getting uh, some funding about their work. Well, uh, as I already explained to you, um, uh, uh, there are many issues that come up. Curators and museum employees like us many times have to work more without having any additional payment for this. So one solution is always a time off, so you work three hours more, you get three hours off tomorrow. The artistic production uh, uh, is actually what, in, actually in the whole Greek uh, state right now, is the best uh, example of Peter Steyer's um, article about its politics of art. Most of the people are not paid. Um, this is a very big problem, and it's a, especially if you are an institution and you want to give an example of how things should work, uh, this is uh, almost an embarrassment sometimes. On the other hand, there are a few collectives, we're going to see the examples following, um, of artists. They decide to all together work uh, collectively, so they will survive in a way, but uh, it's a question of uh, if actually this works. Now, a very uh, familiar and quite famous example, very institutionalized uh, in a way, is Stefano Stigopoulos presentation in the last uh, uh, Venice Biennial. It was the Greek pavilion uh, um, presentation. Uh, well, I wanted to talk about the work and the way it was uh, paid, funded. Uh, the work is quite political and uh, in an economical as well, well way. Um, the the artist uh, was supported by the Greek Ministry, of course, of Culture. Uh, like this, all the pavilions so are always uh, supported by the ministry, ministries of the country. Uh, and he were, his work was about money and uh, alternative ways of uh, economy as well. And three, it was a great archive of alternative economy around the world, globally. And uh, as well, three videos presenting a homeless person gathering um, uh, silver objects, oh, so, sorry, um, iron objects in order to leave, to get some money. Uh, a well-established artist who was, in, uh, was trying to find uh, in Athens, in the crisis of Athens, some kind of um, uh, you know, inspiration. And a very rich lady who had so much money and she was buying art and almost in a, an Alzheimer's situation. And her idea was to make uh, origami flowers from euros. And when she was tired of them, she was destroying them in the garbage. So he kind of connected the three videos in a very uh, clever way. Uh, this is a quite political statement artwork, but still it is supported by the ministry with plenty of money, like lots of thousands of money. And he's a lucky artist, this is what I wanted to talk about his example. On the other hand, we have a different example of, uh, uh, it's not actually just art, with the political um, uh, involvement, but a whole uh, event, a whole biennale based on political and political concerts. It was the fourth Athens Biennial. And it was called Agora, you know, Agora in ancient Greek is not just something like a market, but also a place where people gather and talk about uh, social and political issues. It was organized in the Stock Exchange building, the ex actually, and uh, it had the aesthetic of a spot that was actually a kind of um, uh, uh, 
concert to make it look like a squat. And um, it was interesting because it looked like a squat, but it had plenty, plenty of budget involved and lots of money uh, running. Now, another very, it's a very um, recent ex uh, example, actually, the Depression Era Collective had a, an opening last week at the Bernanke Museum. Uh, this is a collective of more than 30 photographers uh, who are documenting, this is actually more or less the idea, documenting what is happening in Greece after the crisis. Uh, it is interesting that they use the Depression Era expression uh, for what is going on in Greece. Uh, a few examples of photography, so you can see they're just documenting what is going on. And here's a view of the Benaki Museum uh, exhibition right now. Uh, this collective works as a collective, but they're not like an anarchist collective. They finally made it to have uh, an exhibition at the Benaki Museum. It's very difficult to have if you cannot find uh, the funding for this. So they had some uh, quite well good funding by an organization called NEON. It's an organization running with uh, um, from the collector and the entrepreneur, one of the biggest president, I think, of the factory owners in Greece, uh, Pascal Lopoulos. He's actually paying for the presentation of uh, Tsipopoulos' exhibition right now at the Contemporary Arts Center in Thessaloniki. So um, it looks like collectives and uh, kind of sport uh, presentations of art and political art is right now uh, presented thanks to private funding, even though it is institutionalized. That was kind of my, my aim, that's what I wanted to present. And here's another uh, quite political idea of work. This is actually a website, this is the, the URL. Uh, if you're interested, this is Bill Balasco's work. It was presented in the previous Saloniki Benara. And the idea was to just have a question uh, presented um, on and off on a website without an end. And this is actually a question almost every day in Greece. And this way I want to go to another uh, different, totally non-funded at all from anyone example. Before I finish with this uh, parenthesis. Um, this guy is called denial of service. He doesn't receive money by anyone. He denies that. It's a part of his ideological uh, consistency. And uh, he makes music and videos at the same time by himself. And he's in, a, in an anger, I would say, and denial as well situation. Uh, so he, what, what he does is he deconstructs the political images and what is happening. Even uh, if you can see people are quite uh, familiar images and politicians in, um, in Greece, if you are aware of them. So let's talk about the money and the situation and how it goes. You can see the differences here. Uh, in the budget. Of course, the 2010, 2010 is the year that we actually got the Troika uh, involvement in Greece, so everything was different uh, after that, since then. Uh, the amount you see, the three millions, of course, are also covering the Kostakis collection payoff. That was the last uh, payoff uh, of the collection. It took many, many years, since 1997 or 80, if I'm not wrong. And then things got really, really low. The amounts you see, especially the 2011 uh, budget and 14, is just uh, almost, because not all of it, is what covers the salaries of us working at the museum, of, all, of the staff. But that means that you can work, but you don't have money to work. You just get a salary and you have to find a way of having an exhibition without money. Um, you cannot blame anyone because this is the situation and you have to respect your job and the artists who are the people who give you work as well. So what can you do? We're quite, quite lucky, 
I have to admit, because even though we are in a very difficult situation, and these situations, believe me, create many problems even between the people working in the museum. This is what any kind of crisis creates, and this is actually what I wanted to ask. The, the Greek crisis did something uh, different than what happened in Cyprus. It really destroyed society. Uh, it's like Greek society has become something um, I wasn't aware, no one was aware of, something very divided. Thankfully, though, uh, and if you see the, the little museum society as a metaphor of the rest, it could be quite nice. Um, the Board of Trustees uh, decided to give priority, first of all, to not fire anyone which was very important, uh, of course, for everyone. And then, of course, to raise money uh, so we could also have not just people working in the museum, but exhibitions happening. Well, it was a state of emergency for everyone. And uh, we were really having problems even between us. Uh, we had problems with our superiors. Superiors asked for more from us, but we would deny. We had to find a way, as uh, people working there, to to kind of resist to the things that we were asked many times. To also support in an ideological way our job and our profession, and of course our scientific view. And uh, also face the fact that uh, the museum was, though it is half. Uh, public and half private, it was actually getting and it is getting more and more privatized. So, how can you resist and also react, do something, you know, uh, and stay alive? So, what happened, and it, it's quite interesting because it happens not with a strategy, we couldn't have a strategy, we can all, all only have tactics. Uh, it was quite, quite interesting, and uh, it happened in a very instinctive way. It was not like you had a plan. We have no plan for more than six months now. It's impossible to have a plan that you don't know if you're going to get the rest of the money you need to go on. So, thankfully, everyone maintained a presence of mind, because otherwise it would be a panic inside the museum. We had to to always remember almost every day, sometimes every hour, what exactly our profession is about. And uh, stay united, that was so important, it's so difficult to have them, believe me. And then of course, move step by step. The tactics, I mean, uh, I, I say tactics because strategy is what all the museums want to follow, all the big organizations want to follow to have a very certain identity. That was the first problem the museum had. Its identity was kind of <coughs> collapsing, destroyed. And the tactics, I, I don't know if you are aware of Michel de Certeau's idea of strategies are about big things, and that's about small reactions. Well, we had to go with the small ones. Um, the idea was that we find money in any way we can by everyone working at the museum, even uh, if it's possible from the secretary. Uh, because the existing museum staff was all we can have. We could not, for example, ask for or employ a manager. Uh, then someone should be fired so a manager would come. So that wasn't a good solution. Um, well, we kept on um, working with the European programs. We were quite aware of these, uh, of, uh, of their codes. In a way, we worked many years with European programs. It's actually uh, why it's actually funding the, the Thessaloniki Biennale, and it's saving our lives, in a way. We had to reinvent our events in a way that we could have a fee, but you're a public museum, the state museum, so you know, able and you know, allow actually to have a very uh, big fee, but keep things in a um, normal and logical uh, scale. And uh, we had a very big crowdfunding campaign, which is actually running uh, still, uh, called the Support the SMCA. Uh, it's not helping a lot, but it's doing something. Even one euro, you start to <coughs> you begin to appreciate even one euro. 
and of course the bad factors and uh, forgive me for using this same bad factor because it is of course the Nazis, the Nyakos Foundation, big banks where we are asking help from embassies and entrepreneurs in Thessaloniki, in Greece, abroad, whatever. This is a major capital, this is an ideological um, question that you face every day, a dilemma in a way, but uh, in terms of surviving, uh, even some spears or some colleagues will say this is the only way we can go on and we try to keep an ideological balance uh, while working. Um, this metaphor of survival and being involved in politics and making things happen but respecting your ideology, well this Padio um, uh, idea that's actually presented in, uh, I think it's um, this aspect in the book, if I'm not wrong, is very interesting because um, he says more or less that we should try and find new ways of existing and making the things we want happen. Of course, you, it, it could be dangerous to, to see this as a chance of being more, um, um, what's the right word, more compromising. Well, actually being less compromising. You have to survive being or being the most accurate you can to what you believe. Well, for us, it's been all these things I've just described. Of course, um, you know, every month more and more privatized, things come all the time. It's like you perpetually have to face um, a new challenge and a new way uh, to survive in a digni dignified, uh, you know, manner. Uh, I really don't know what's going to happen. Nobody knows. Uh, it's just that, thankfully, up to now, we are not. Uh, we, as we are a small community, we kind of make it to survive because we are united. And I think this is the most interesting part of it. And I hope this will happen in the Greek society as well. If, if, Museums could be a metaphor, humanities could be a metaphor. Uh, that would be quite uh, helpful for everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Really, uh, thanks to all of our speakers for their uh, interesting presentations, and thank you also for being with us. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to hang around some more, we can uh, uh, open the floor for more questions, comments, reactions, discussion, also among the speakers themselves, if they like. So, yes, uh, again, Yanni. Right. Anyway, I feel like a kiss attention. He's happy on his mobile phone. <laughs> 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 on the internet, not Facebook. <laughs> 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 and let there be light. Anyway, any questions, comments, please? Uh, for that, for that. Yes, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, like I said before, if anybody wants to put something in Greek, that's also a feasible. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, right. Um, you talked a lot about funding of, of the political economy in Saloni. Um, there was a number there about 3,000 and also 1,000 for the Yeah. 3,000 the exhibition you Yeah, for the exhibition, yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, is that including everything? I mean, uh, accommodation, flights no. for the artists, no, 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 no. Uh, extra equipment they might need for setting up no. the exhibition, stuff like that? Because it sounds like a very small number. Um, it is. Um, <laughs> it's a <pretty> <laughs> Quite unrealistic, really, for this scale of exhibition, really. Uh, so that's why I was wondering uh, if there was additional costs to that, um, that like the things I just mentioned. Maybe uh, I should have a better list. Yeah, I should have a list of what we actually did. What we paid for a flyer, we paid for, uh, uh, for a, we had to pay for the banner and the wall stickers and the, all this basic stuff of every kind of production you have. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we didn't pay artist fees, uh, we didn't pay for accommodation, apart from one case, if I'm not wrong. Um, we didn't pay for anything to be carried on. So I think a couple of couriers, and that was it. We didn't have to pay for much. That's why we managed to have the exhibition. So we had the hour. equipment anyway. It was all happening with equipment we already you know owned from the museum. We couldn't have a better projector, we didn't have 
for example, when I think of Hamas World was it, he had a Blu-ray, but we couldn't have a Blu-ray player. <laughs> so, or, or even if we did have a Blu-ray player, we had a, we didn't have a high definition projector. So we had to compromise with, with what do we have. We kind of asked him if it was okay, he saw it, he said, it's just fine, it works, okay. He could just make a scene, but he didn't. I don't understand if he did. So, well, sound was the actual amount you had? Yeah. Uh, including tax. Yeah, sure. And thanks. Um, okay, uh, I had the chance to visit you at the museum. We are working a lot and for, so I fully understand because I'm running as well a place, a cultural place, I fully understand. But my question is, uh, as far as you are applying for private sponsor, more and more, how, where do you think that there needs to be stopped you to have the politically correct uh, policy tomorrow? Okay, you are saying now you are in the phase where you are acting, reacting to survive in tactics, as you say. But as far as the private sector might not understand what exactly you want to achieve in the long term, or they might poison your policy. So my question is, how far are you ready uh, uh, to go in the private sector and accept the terms mm -hmm. of financial support tomorrow? Uh, because you mentioned something properly that is you are in between borders, again, uh, between public sector and private sector. So what exactly the poison you are uh, aiming to put inside to just to survive? Well, that's a question I cannot actually uh, reply myself. That should be actually a question for my superiors. But in any case, uh, because I know how they think in a way, they try uh, to let the smallest amount of poison enter our world. Shall they really sell? Helpful. Shall they think at some point that they should that they should sell maybe a part of the collection? Is it something possible? No, that's no. not of the question until now, of course. But I, I, because I've heard about this, and it, actually there was a rumor for a period. No, that's out of the question. It, you cannot sell it anyway because it is it is public. Uh, it's Greek state uh, fortune. You don't have the right uh, yourself, no, as a museum or as a director or anything. Uh, to, to play with that, you're not allowed. Mm. It's like you're selling uh, archaeological activities, you don't have the right to do it, it's illegal. Okay, but there is a temptation, as uh, Frank Gehry was mentioned before, mm. uh, this bizarre border between contenu uh, et contenant, who you might promote tomorrow. Is it uh, the next extension uh, sponsored by the next future amazing architect? Or is it the founder, uh, a private, uh, you know, collector or a mesen, uh, might be pointed out uh, and uh, me maybe more supported than the name of the collection? I mean, uh, you, you know what I mean? Is that we, names? I mean, the branding of the museum yeah. might be poisoned by those supporters in the I private can, sector. That's why I'm, I'm mentioning. This. For now, I see that our directors are quite. Busy. There is, so there is a resistance. There is a resistance. Yeah. It's a very clear one, and um, you know it's interesting because um, we had a, we had a very big uh, uh, proposal by a very big telephone mobile company, but uh, we also wanted to check. I mean, they were giving us plenty of money, but we also wanted to check what was the. Uh, the, 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 the main idea they wanted to pass and they wanted to have a, an educational program at the center and support it with lots of lots of money. But it, it was an educational program for kids at school promoting their mobile company. So we denied. There are other museums in Thessaloniki that, that accepted actually because yeah. it was a lot of money. Sure. But we denied. Um, it's kind of, we know we're going to have for as long as we do have a salary, whatever it's called salary anymore. But we know that from now on, we are responsible of funding in a dignified way what we do. Thankfully, this is what is important. We see resistance from our directors. They see resistance from us as for our labor as well, because of course problems come up all the time. And we kind of have a balance 
because we discuss about it. So yeah, but you have to adapt as well. We adapt. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. I hope for you that you will not meet the next uh, retail foundation uh, brand name by uh, you know the, fi the financial supporter or by the yeah. architect of the brand getting and you will keep the Kosaki's uh, collection. I really hope for you. Yeah. There are examples like the National Museum of Athens. The problems created there because they had such a huge amount from the NEO organization that now it's almost everywhere. And you're like, hmm, this is a national museum. What is going on? And the, the ministers don't seem to be bothered. They're like, good, you're doing a good job. You're capitalizing things more. Fantastic. You know, it's, it's very strange. <laughs>